I'm back in the shit again. For months. I've been doing YouTube-y things from the car, mainly. But now I'm back in the shed because it's locked down again. Uh, it, uh, this sounds really bad, but um, I was able to do with it. Yeah, I could do with it. Um, because I've been running around like a headless chook lately. Now, this is very insensitive, of course, but I needed the break. I needed to get back into the shed. And that sounds uh, really insensitive for people who are suffering, of course, um, as a result of things like lockdown or dying, you know. But, you know, there'll be an ironic twist uh, if I catch the thing and wind up dead in my shed. <laughs> you can cop it yourself. You can, you know, you can cop it in the neck yourself. But anyway, a random thing to talk about today. Settled on Manchuria. <laughs> you didn't expect that, Charlie. I talk to myself, you see. Um, now how did I get onto Manchuria? There was a way. Um, I actually don't remember. Um, for some reason, I was Googling Manchuria. Yeah, the Manchurian incident earlier. Now, what come out of that? Japan somehow. Uh, because they were involved. Oh, it was random, I remember. I was um, just listening to the BBC, as I do. And they were talking about it. The Manchurian incident. Aha! Now I remember how, how why they were talking. I wasn't. I was listening to an audio book. Um, I'm listening to The Great Lectures, which is a series in audiobooks occasionally I buy one of the great lectures um, uh, I've, I've bought one on mathematics at one stage there and on, and on chemistry I think um, but this one is on the one I've bought economics yeah, um, um, the economics of the world since 1400 since 1400 um, and way back then you know China was kind of the biggest global power um, involved in some of the biggest uh, trade routes, um, which actually made me think, oh, right, because it's all right, so they were the biggest, and the Western world was on the fringe, you know, it was an outpost, you know, um, so it was a nothing. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder, well, how come China has become the king of the world now, and not Africa, for example, and, you know, this provides a clue of sorts, I think, um, well, they, they were... <laughs> You know, it was an aberration that the Western world was the king of the world. Maybe. You know, maybe it's natural for China to be in charge, because there were once before, uh, in about 1400, and they had the biggest ships back then. They made our ships look puny. Um, they sailed all over the joint, across to Africa and all that sort of thing in 14-whatever. Um, maybe 1412 or something like that. And, uh, hang on. What is Christopher Columbus, 1492 or something? I lose track of all the dates. They're not important to me. And, um, and you know, they had quite a fleet. Uh, and they could have taken over the whole world, even back then. Uh, but they had a change of dynasty or something like that. And the incoming dynasty or something, whatever, you know, scuttled all the ships, said, no, nah, no, nah, we don't want to be a seafaring nation you know, a global power, you know, the incoming dynasty, who knows which one it was, you know, um, and, uh, and that was that, and then Europe rose and became the major seafaring nation in the world, the, now this is about 1400, not long before that, the greatest seafarers were also Asians, I think, if Micronesians are Asians, um, and they fanned out over the Pacific and did some amazing seafaring, the likes of which no other place in the world was doing, you know, even back then. They were finding their way to places like New Zealand and all that sort of thing. Humans arrived in New Zealand, I think, 13... No, no, even earlier. Might have even, might've even, might've even been before 1000. 
you know, maybe it was around about a thousand AD, um, which is a bit of a surprise for me in a way because you know, like you've got Indigenous Australians here. Um, uh, my shed pays respects. It does uh, because it is on Wurundjeri land, uh, and. Um, so we have Indigenous Australians here, and you have Maoris over in New Zealand. I've always thought, how come that Maori's got a treaty, you know? And um, from the uh, incoming Britishers, you know? And um, the Indigenous Australians didn't. Well, you know, a little bit of that is... There's no way to compare Maoris with Indigenous Australians, because Indigenous Australians had been here for 40,000 years, and... Um, Indigenous Maoris weren't all that indigenous, really. They got there only not too long before the British got there, you know, to New Zealand at least. Um, look, I know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but not that, you know, maybe 900 years, you know, which is a long time, but um, not that long, you know. Um, and they were not so much Maoris as they were expat, Micronesians or something like that, you know. Um, so they just, just got there, really. And they would have brought all sorts of um, what we call civilization across, you know, to New Zealand. They were already a seafaring nation before they got to New Zealand. Well, the Indigenous Australians would have been a bit seafaring too, coming across from Timor. Uh, but not on the same sort of, that's not on the same sort of scale as what the... Um, Maoris, well, Micronesians were achieving as they fanned out across the Pacific and went as far as like Tahiti and all these sorts of places. It's amazing that they, how did they even do that? You know, they picked their way across the Pacific. Apparently they have, they had maps. I was listening to another audio book about this. Um, they're not maps. Other way we have maps, you know, um, you know, we, we draw our maps on pieces of paper. Uh, but they used to have an arrangement on the beach and all that sort of stuff with pegs and, you know, and sticks and things stuck in, you know, like a real a map on the beach of the way the currents work and all that sort of stuff. You know, um, we had no way, you know, back then, this is way before Captain Cook and his magnificent clock and all that sort of stuff, John Harrison, yeah. And, um, but um, they were able to pick their way across vast expanses of water and find tiny islands and all that sort of stuff, which you might think is, oh yeah, all right, so let's just follow the birds or something. But it's a bit more complicated than that, as far as I know. Um, these little islands are pinbricks in the Pacific, absolute pinbricks. You know, you take something like the biggest ship in the world at the moment, I don't even know what it's called, you know, those... Um, yeah, oh, there's one called the world, you know, um, and um, if that, if that, you know, it looks huge when it comes, one of those comes into Melbourne or something like that, and you sort of think, wow, that's big, you could spot that wherever it was in the world. But from a satellite looking down on the Pacific, is if one of those things is in the middle of the Pacific, you can't even see it because it's so small, it's just a pinprick. You know, the Titanic is just like the tiniest little pebble, that's how big that is in the vast expanse of the Atlantic, because <laughs> it never got to the Pacific. All right, so that's that. But um, I did get on to something else. Um, what was I talking about? Did I start talking about Manchuria? Uh, now, economics, ah, that's what I was talking about, economics. And, um, ah, yes. I was, I was talking about, um, I was listening to an audio book and they were talking about the economics of the world coming out of World War One, And, um, and the chat, a lot, a lot of things were happening at once, you know, after World War One, as far as I could gather. Um, uh, you know, they were, the Treaty of Versailles and all that sort of thing. Now, apparently, um, Treaty of Versailles put those punishing reparations on Germany. All right, and this, you know, and and with that, you know, 
um, the economy of the world started to carve itself out post-war. And um, apparently the USA, which was very cashed up after the war in a way that the UK wasn't, and in a way that France wasn't, for example, uh, um, had a big stake in the reparations that were levied on Germany. Now I don't know how that worked, but a lot of a lot of wars and things start with debt, you know. So I think um, maybe all right. I think this is how it would have gone. Yes, I think I heard this. England and France borrowed a lot of money from the USA because you know um, England and France were in the middle of the war zone. Um, in World War Two, all right, and places like the USA and here in Australia weren't. Um, all right, um, oh look, a little bombing in Darwin, a little bombing in Pearl Harbor. So you know, we got a taste. Places like the USA and Australia, but we um, didn't suffer much damage at all. All right, now uh, so we're all cashed up and all that sort of stuff. Right, so. Um, now, England had a, had to pay a lot of money back to the USA, and the USA wanted their money back, and so did France. And France and the USA wanted its money back from France too. Um, part of the whole deal was such that Germany had to pay France and England a hell of a lot of money in reparations. But then England and and and, and but the way the USA saw that is that England and France had to then yeah that would allow England and France to pay the USA off. So the USA was pretty keen on those reparations. In fact, England uh, could see that it was a dangerous policy. Um, they had a genius um, economist on deck in the English, Keynes, Keynesian economics. And he warned against such punishing reparations. He said that's going to come to no good. And um, he was one. He was a he was a very smart cookie because he was the person that came up with the idea of the counterintuitive idea of um, that if you um, in the good times tighten your belt. You know, this was his advice to governments: spend less during the good times. Uh, but um, if the bad times come along, as they are right now, here with the coronavirus, and as they were with the global the global financial crunch, <laughs> global finance the global <laughs> the global financial crunch, and all that sort of stuff, um, that's when governments nowadays spend big. Whereas in the past, they used to tighten their belt um, when things were going bad, and it actually made things worse in a capitalist sort of sense. Um, so it's all counterintuitive, and it took a genius like Keynes um, to come up with that. But in, uh, you know, Keynes and England were sort of saying, "No, hang on, this is a pro this is problematic." And even France was sort of saying the same thing, as far as I can tell. Listen, these reparations that this is going to come back and bite us, and they were kind of agitating, you know. But they couldn't say much, you know, because they owed the USA so much money. But the USA apparently was very brutal and said, no, the reparations stand um, because we need Germany to pay you, England, and then we need Germany to pay you, France, so that you can pay us. That's America for you. But you can see from their point of view, um, the American people were pr probably going to vote out anybody who um, wasn't going to go along with that sort of thinking. So, you know, do the right thing and get voted out and the wrong thing happens anyway. That can happen. All right. So, anyway, all this, everything overheated and everything went wrong and all that sort of stuff. And then there was the Great Depression. Now, the way out of the Great Depression, Keynes argued, um, was for governments to spend up big. You know, the, the natural instinct of governments was to spend small. Because we're in a depression. Everyone, tighten your belts. We haven't got much money. Ah, Keynes said, do the opposite of what you think. Spend up big, you know. So um, they did. Uh, and one way to spend up big, well, Japan 
was switched onto this and Germany too, um, is to spend up big, you know, because you've got to spend up big on something. It almost doesn't matter what. You know, it's, like, it's the way we've been operating lately when we've had global cri financial crises. Um, uh, suddenly, you know, we have these things where the government gives everybody money. Um, and you'd think that would be the wrong thing to do, but it works because what you're doing, Keynes argued, is you're creating demand and then the supply will follow whereas everyone used to think that supply was the driver that was what i was listening to on my um audio book you know everyone used to be supply focused and um, when Keynes came along he said no be demand focused because sometimes you're over supplying and demand is really the king not supply so focus on demand and what do you do when in the down times create demand how do you do that Give out as much money as you possibly can. You know, spend, spend, spend. And um, Japan picked up on that and said, we will spend, spend, spend. Germany picked up on that. And they were that's when they built those autobahns, I think. I think that's when all that started. You know, huge infrastructure projects. You know? uh, Japan said, well, we're going to build up our military. <laughs> and that works. You know? um, and Germany also started building up its military. Oh, I feel World War Two coming along. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, but look, the focus was economics, and this was all seen as a pretty good thing to do for everybody. So everybody's, and then everybody started noticing Germany building up its military. It's maybe they noticed Japan doing the same thing too. But um, and then they started building up, building up their militaries, and that kind of started helped get got everyone get everyone out of the depression a little bit. Um, uh, but um, I think. From what I heard, England jumped early, you know, because they had the guy, they had the they had the brains on their team, Keynes, and um and there was all sorts of other things involved. They had to decouple, you know, the the, the idea was to uncouple from what was called the gold standard, which we we've all got the gold standard these days again, but uncouple the your currency from gold so that you're free to devalue your currency, for example, and all this. Oh, a lot of complex economics in all of this, and a lot of it's counterintuitive. And England deliberately devalued its currency. Yeah. And um, that um, shocked everybody, I think, because they weren't switched on. They didn't have a genius on their team. Z team. They. <laughs> Teams. Um... Anyway, it all went like that. But anyway, the thing was, Japan could see at some stage that it was in their interests um, if they became very expansionist and maybe even picked a fight with the entire world, or the entire Western world at least, and China as well. And apparently, you know, and this might have been the first shot uh, of fired in world war in, leading up to world war Two, and um the manchurian incident that's how i got onto that and um what happened um japan um wanted to build up build up build up militarily and all that sort of stuff and it was actually you know that was their response to the worldwide kind of depression um some places were more depressed than others germany especially um you know the the mark you know, it used to be, I think, four, worth four US dollars or something like that. And then it went to four trillion, quadrillion, billion. <laughs> and wasn't worth even toilet paper. Um, but Japan, they started, the government, you know, the J Japanese government started spending big, doing exactly what Keynes would have said was a good idea. And it was working. And Japan was going very well, thank you very much. And, but they wanted to go bigger. And they'd built, they were building factories and all this sort of stuff. Japan, um, it's kind of, um, you know, they're kind of doing a Germany because Germany was doing the same thing at the same time. Um, and this was kind of good for America, I guess, because, you know, if Germany's making some money, then Germany can pay England and France and England and France can pay the US and all that sort of, you know, coming out of World War One, which had been recent at this point in time. And, um, but Japan was spending a big, but Japan to drive its new industrialization, 
you know, was this the only really industrialised place in all of Asia? I think so. Um, needed resources, um, and they needed whatever they needed, coal, maybe, and all these sorts of things that, you, you know, with which to make steel, and all this sort of thing. So, um, now, um, so, they, one way or another, they ended up owning some railway lines and all that sort of stuff in China. Um, so they were getting their grubby little fingers uh, into China already. And they had a, a lease over a railway line. The English had already been doing that too, hopping into China and all that sort of stuff and doing bad things. Um, the Opium Wars and all that sort of stuff, which had been many years earlier in the 1800s, I believe. But this is all, you know, you know, England at its height, you know, was kind of raping China <laughs> to a certain extent. And, um, and, and, and now Japan was doing the same thing. Now Japan had been doing some amazing things. Um, they defeated, um, Russia at one stage there, I think 1905 or something, aided a little bit by the weather, you know, um, I think what the Russian ships might have, you know, suffered a bit of a Spanish Armada kind of um, experience, um, but um, but Japan, they needed they. It wasn't enough just to be in China. I think they wanted to actually just take over huge whacks of China where all the resources were. And one of those places, you know, like coal or whatever. And one of those places was Manchuria, and it would appear. I think the evidence is in. I don't think there's any dispute about this. I think they know his name. A, a Japanese officer um, was uh, given the task of blowing up a section of one of the Japanese train lines in China. Yeah, a Japanese military officer was to blow up a Japanese train line in China, specifically in Manchuria. Um, and that this was um, so that the Japanese could say, well, who to blame the Chinese for that, you know? You often shoot down your own helicopter in war. Um, there's reasons for that. Okay, so, so this Japanese officer went and blew up a small section of uh, a Japanese run or Japanese leased or Japanese owned railway line that was bringing resources to Japan anyway. So he interrupted that, but only a little bit, you know, he just blew up a section. And then um, that gave Japan a chance to become outraged. China, you know, uh, is one great big terrorist organization. It blew up our train line. So we are going to invade. And that's exactly what Japan wanted to do because they'd been building up this military anyway, whoosh, into China. So swarm all over Manchuria and take over the joint and all that sort of stuff. And that's why China's upset to this day for actions like that on the part of Japan. Now, but the interesting thing about that is, um, okay, so, um, Japan was aware, it would seem, that, um, that well, one of Japan's motivations was that it wanted to pick a fight. With the whole wide world because it could see that that might be in its own interests i believe now after the war that's world war one uh, a thing called the league of nations had been set up that's like the united nations now but the previous version the previous failure has distinct from the current failure well yeah the current failure is not it does all right yeah. time will tell whether it will last forever the league of nations didn't anyway the league of nations have been set up to keep the peace basically and do other peaceful things um peace enforcement after world war one now japan in invading manchuria uh, was not only making a resource grab japan was also testing the league of nations and from what i heard it was uh, rather deliberately um testing the united nations and the united nations the league of nations now, the idea was, we're just going to go and invade Manchuria. Now, the League of Nations has said that it will step in if anyone does anything like that. Let's see if it does. It didn't. Test number one was finished. 
and um, the League of Nations at that point in time was starting to look like all talk, no action. When something like, you know, when there was a clear breach of sovereignty of another nation and all that sort of stuff, this is what the League of Nations was set up to do, to stop this sort of thing. You know, this imperialism and all this sort of stuff, you know. You know Europe didn't want imperialism. You know, it already had all of Africa. <laughs> anyway, all right, so, um, and Australia, and the United States a lot of other places too um so um as i understand it the world saw that and saw that and said to itself wow i thought the league of nations was going to stop that sort of thing you know because it's very similar to some of the stuff that used to happen and um and and then what happened then? I've got my son texting here. I'll have to go and attend to him. I'm going to cut this one short. Um, that was test number one. I could have gone on and on and on about that, but I'll finish off really, really quickly. Um, now, test number two was Mussolini invaded Abyssinia. And again, the League of Nations did nothing. And test number three was Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. And again, the League of Nations did nothing. At this point, the League of Nations becomes irrelevant. It's um, because it's toothless. Um, and then we all know, we'll know what happened next. You know? you know, Hitler was sitting and watching, and so was Japan. Every time um, we do one of these invasions, any of us um, does one of these invasions, the League of Nations does nothing. And then suddenly Japan said, and you know, Japan, Germany, and Italy got together and said, "Let's team up." You know, the Axis powers, and um, and you know, they, they were really tests of the League of Nations, of the metal of the T League of Nations, um, and the League of Nations was found wanting. Um, and and then Hitler just went invaded Poland, and away we went. All right, so that's how that worked, and the League of Nations was dead. You know. All right, so that's that. Um, now, uh, oh, I've got to finish. I've got texts coming through. All right, see you later.